Good evening, I'm Siri Lechnes. I'm very proud to be here at the Science and Cocktails uh, this evening. I'll be telling you, I won't be explaining love or pain or pleasure or anything like that. You know, I can't do that in 45 minutes, but I will be telling you some of the stuff that I find really fun about how to do science on pain, pleasure and love. So how would you go about sort of telling a love story from a scientific perspective? Well, I thought I'd start by telling a love story from a completely normal perspective. So uh, when I met my husband 14 years ago, I was in a cocktail bar. He was a bartender. You know, magic ensued. He filled, you know, my criteria, which at the time were kind of low. It was basically... <laughs> I wanted somebody tall, as you can probably understand why, and, um, and single, I thought, would, you know, would be a good start. <laughs> but so the way that you tell a love story in sort of a normal conversation would be things like how you met, um, you know, how you like, felt like you were, you know, twin souls, and, you know, how much you had to drink, potentially. Um, so as a scientist, you would attack the problem of love from a completely different angle. Um, so for one, you might not actually address um, human love at all. So a lot of the, the science of love that I'll be talking about this evening is actually uh, based largely on non-human animals and specifically on animals that form mon monogamous social relationships, uh, such as swans. But because we're scientists, we don't start, you know, with love. We start chipping away at the question and basically looking at sub-processes. And the favorite species um, for researchers who research love is the prairie wall. So something has happened to the screen, so actually you can't see the top and the bottom or the titles. I don't know if you can fix that. Um, but in the meantime, you can see the top of the um, prairie voles. <laughs> so the reason that people research prairie voles is basically that they are little rodents. They, you know, a little bit like rats, um, and they form these monogamous relationships that, when you do paternity tests, turn out to be socially monogamous, but not sexually monogamous. Uh, so uh, in that sense, they're a good model for, for you know, human relationships. <laughs> um, and the reason that they're such a favored sort of research animal is that you can compare them to a very related species called the mountain vole that is promiscuous, i.e. it doesn't form these uh, sort of lifelong you know, bonds. And so, as a scientist, you would basically start by saying, okay, let's you know, forget all about love and start talking about social bonds. And uh, let's break it down into the formation of the bond, i.e., you know, like say, you know, getting to know somebody or falling in love. And then the sort of second stage would be a sort of maintaining the bond, i.e., for instance, staying married. Um, and with the voles, one thing that, that people have discovered, not just with wolves, actually, with a lot of different animals, is that although we don't tend to think of it as a prerequisite for human love, it's really, really important to be able to recognize the other individual. So, <laughs> so essentially, if you don't recognize you know, the individual that you, you, know, you might be falling for, um, that's the end of your love affair. You know, <laughs> like, you're gonna be completely promiscuous, really happy to meet somebody else uh, next time. And so researchers have shown that you can, you know, block certain processes in the brain, um, especially focusing on the oxytocin system and actually block the ability to uh, form bonds because of the recognition. And also with sheep, this is kind of cute, you can take a virgin female sh sheep, do you still call them sheep? <laughs> Um, give them oxytocin, present them with a lamb, and they will start thinking it's their lamb and that they're, you know, they're a mother, as it were. Um, so another sub-process that you can address with voles, um, and that maybe shows a sort of a, hopefully shows a 
another difference with humans is that uh, mating creates a sort of hormonal context that's really important for the formation of a sort of stable bond. Uh, and so although, you know, it's no surprise to anybody that we associate love and sex in human cultures, uh, we don't tend to think of it as a kind of a prerequisite um, for forming long-term relationships, thankfully. Um, and so the mating and the recognition together um, create the possibility to sort of have a preference. And so basically, part of falling in love is developing a preference for that individual over other individuals, right? So, you know, it doesn't sound very poetic, but on the other hand, it, you know, it's not, it's kind of hard to argue with. Um, and uh, for the preference, we know that um, opioids are um, an important sort of neurochemical system. Um, and then we have another sub um, process that seems to be really important for the perivals that again, hopefully isn't the prerequisite for human love. And it's that um, <laughs> what they find is that when you really want to get to the transition from a sort of um, a bond being formed and to a bond that can be maintained over the course of a lifetime, uh, for the male voles, uh, the female becoming pregnant really helps. <laughs> um, and then there is uh, one other fact about the voles that I really wanted to share with you because I find it hilarious. So one of the key processes involved in like the stable, you know, lifelong socially monogamous relationships that these really super cute animals have, uh, and that you know we like to romanticize. You see, you know, swans or even common ducks, and we think, oh, you know, they they love each other. Um, so one of the ways that makes that possible is that they find every other conspecific of the opposite sex revolting. <laughs> and that really helps. So <laughs> I guess on, on the whole, as humans, we can be kind of happy that we don't find every, you know, I don't find every other man that my husband, you know, revolting. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, maybe if we did, we wouldn't have, you know, high divorce rates. So I guess, you know, there's a pro and con with every process. In any case, despite the fact that I've now highlighted a lot of differences um, between voles and humans, a lot of what we know about human love or about the neurochemical basis of human love is really um, comes from, you know, the study of these little cute guys. And it really implicates basically oxytocin, opioids, dopamine, and kappa opioids. Okay, so another question uh, that I think is really interesting is why are close relationships so important? And I think the answer to that question will really depend on whether you ask a philosopher or a poet or, you know, a filmmaker or you know, just anybody in the street. Like, we all know that close relationships are important, and we all kind of have our own reasons um, for thinking why that might be. So as a sort of, uh, as a neuroscientist uh, interested in sort of evolutionarily preserved mechanisms, my favorite explanation is, is evolutionary. And I think it can il be illustrated basically by looking at human infants. Uh, for the first three months um, that human infants are born, they basically can do almost nothing. And essentially, we know, I mean, we know from common sense, but we also know from those horrible studies from, of, of, you know, babies in Romanian orphanages, that without human contact, children don't develop properly, even if we feed them and change their nappies, um, that's not enough. We don't become, you know, like, functional humans without a lot of close relationships. Um, however, this is true for many animals. Basically, all mammals rely on feeding, you know, from their mother uh, during the sort of hormonal context that's created around birth and nursing. So, for instance, with rodents, uh, that will be the case when the rodents are young. But then it will generally speaking, change um, so that rodents will be much more okay and they will be able to survive uh, even if socially isolated uh, in their natural environment. 
in contrast, primates, um, um, apes and humans, in evolutionary terms, if we are isolated from our group, if we're basically, you know, we commit some sort of a breach and we are excluded um, as a species, if isolated, we will die. Um, so, I mean, at this point, with seven billion people, it's kind of impossible to imagine that we could ever be isolated to that extent. Um, but in sort of prehistoric humans, uh, that would be the case. And so that would be my explanation for why close relationships are so important to us and why we're so, so, so sensitive to any kind of cue that we're being, you know, excluded or that we're, you know, even at risking, like anybody frowning at what we said or did, um, or talking about us behind our backs, and all of those things that we are so, so sensitive to and that we find very, very painful. So that uh, then creates the bridge to the sort of second part of the talk, um, which centers around uh, the key question that basically um, inspires all of my research. I won't really be presenting my own research today, but I'll be talking a little bit about the questions. So, how do the brain and body give rise to pleasure and pain? It's really a, a sort of a question that almost requires a little bit of magic to answer it. In that sense, it's a bit like love, right? Um, because we know that the brain is essentially a huge fatty lump. If you take it out of somebody's skull, it tends to be pink. And, um, you know, it has a little bit of, of cells that communicate with each other um, and a lot of fatty tissue and a lot of chemicals. And somehow it gives rise to subjective feelings that we experience, like, you know, the, the feeling of a, of a spring breeze on your cheeks or, you know, the taste of a really nice uh, cocktail. So, as a neuroscientist, uh, it's really fun to be working with pain and pleasure because they are, by definition, subjective. So we tend to call them hedonic because they have a kind of a quality about them. They are either positive or negative, you know, good or bad. And they are subjective. You can only really study them properly in humans because you have to ask people what they feel and what the quality, what the feeling is. Uh, the reason I have a bat on this slide is a kind of a little nod um, to the British philosopher Thomas Nagel, who published a paper called What It Is Like to Be a Bat. In that paper, he argued that we can't know what it's like to be a bat, and specifically he was focusing on vision, because humans use their rods and cones, light falling on them, um, to, you know, to give us vision and to allow us to navigate the world. In contrast, bats you know, send out these echo waves. And so we can't ever imagine what it's like for a bat to see. Because they're doing it in a fundamentally different way. And so he was sort of taking that as a starting point to basically say that we should give up trying to understand the subjective content of another person's mind because we will never know. Like, I will never know if my red is the same as your red. Uh, we will call the same thing red, but you know, maybe for you, it feels like music, and for me, it feels like sand. Um, but that's why it's so cool to be working in this field, because we basically have to deal with a span. It's almost like impossible to bridge span between subjective experience on the one hand and our need for objective scientific explanations on the other hand. And we, you know, we want to be able to say that a painful signal travels in from the periphery, from some part of the body, synapses in the spinal horn and the dorsal horn in the third column, you know, crosses over, then synapses again in various other places, and somehow creates a sensation of pain. Um, so, you know, scientists hate fluffy things like subjective feelings. Uh, but the cool thing, especially about pain, is that we can't get around it because pain is the reason that people, you know, see a, th a therapist or go to the doctor. You know, and pain is by definition subjective. So even if we don't like it and we really want to be able to measure it objectively, we can't because it's a subjective feeling. So how do you go about investigating hedonics or subjective feelings in humans? Well, you tend to start with the brain, 
And then I work in a tradition where basically uh, we use stimuli. So we will, for instance, use, this is a, known as a pain device. It basically heats up, the little circular thing heats up to about, um, to about 50 degrees. You could hold it against somebody's skin. It really hurts. And then you take it off, obviously. <laughs> um, you can give uh, people other sort of pleasurable stimuli. Um, we actually do a, some research where we stroke people's arms. It's very pleasant research. They seem to be able to... <laughs> um, it's not what you expect when you're invited to do a lab experiment, that's for sure. <laughs> and then we tend to uh, either stuff people in a scanner. You can't really see this very well, but you know, it's a huge magnet. We put people in it. We get gray images of brains out with little colored blobs. We love those. Everybody loves those. Uh, the nice thing about humans, though, is that we can add to those. We can use rating scales or questions and basically get people to tell us about the subjective content. And then we can try to relate the measures. We can try to relate what happens in the brain, what happens in the body, to what people are telling us that they experience. Um, and animal researchers have a lot more tools. They can, you know, they can like delete little bits of the brain or, um, you know, suck little substances out to see exactly what happens. We can't do that in humans. It's not ethical. You know, we would love to. <laughs> it's just that the ethics committees won't let us. Um, but what we can do, and what I do a lot in my lab, is that we give people drugs. So. <laughs> Uh, because you can do that as long as they're grown up and they can say, you know, they can give um, informed consent. <laughs> and then what you do is you change the chemistry of the brain, you know, in a systematic manner and you can say something about what causes subjective feelings uh, or what's necessary for various subjective feelings. And then I thought I'd tell you a little bit about some of the sources of inspiration that sort of I draw on in my work and some of the things that are possible to do when you're a neuroscientist and you're interested in subjective feelings. Uh, so the first study is a study by Dana Small that was conducted more than 15 years ago, uh, but it's still a classic. It's called From Pleasure... Let me try again. From Pleasure to Aversion. And what they did is they basically recruited about 20 healthy volunteers who really like chocolate. It's not the hardest study in the world to <laughs> recruit people for. Um, and then they gave them chocolate. So that's all well and good. But what they did is they gave them chocolate again and again and again until even these chocolate lovers were a bit like, blah, I do not want any more chocolate. And every time in between each chocolate bar, they scanned people. And then basically they looked to see where in the brain you would see activity that sort of tracked the decreasing pleasure of chocolate as you had more and more of it. Um, and basically, as you can see here in this nice little colored blob, this little bit right between the eyes or just above the eyes called the uh, ventral orbitofrontal cortex, medial orbitofrontal cortex, seemed to track the decreasing pleasure of the chocolate. Whereas a sort of more lateral region, sitting kind of around here, seemed to increase in intensity as the chocolate got more aversive. Uh, so that's a pretty cool study because essentially the stimulus is always the same, but it's just that the state, you know, the satiety state dictates whether it's pleasant or aversive. And now I'm going to tell you about another source of inspiration that I think you'll probably agree with me that it's pretty surprising because there is a huge and really impressive literature on pleasure in rats. Now, how does that work? You can't ask the rat if it's feeling pleasure, right? I mean, you know, are they just tickling the rat's tummy and assuming that it's liking it? Um, I mean, how do you know? So what they actually do is they draw on this um, sort of convenient finding that there is a, a reflex that we share with other animals. And specifically, so we know about reflexes, like, you know, you have one in your knee, you can measure at the doctors, right? But actually, when human infants are born, we have a lot of reflexes that we lose later in life. Like, you can actually, I think, at a certain age, you can hang an infant from, you know, from its, it will just, its grip is so strong due, due to an instinct, um, a reflex, uh, that it won't fall down. Um, I mean, <laughs> I heard about that. I didn't try it with my own babies. <laughs> it seemed a bit scary. Uh, <laughs> But so what they do in these rodent experiments is basically 
Um, they draw on the fact that when we taste sweet tastes or bitter tastes or sour tastes, um, our faces do involuntary things when we're human infants. It doesn't happen so much when we're grown up, but most people recognize that if you bite into a lemon, your face will kind of almost involuntarily sort of <laughs> screw up a little bit. Um, and then they basically assumed that this reflex in the rat could be a kind of precursor. So they're not assuming that the rat is conscious and that the rat is really feeling pleasure, but they're saying we have a measurement that's that could be the sort of a basis for what then becomes human pleasure later in evolution. Uh, and so on the basis of that, they've basically mapped out a lot of the rat's brain and found little bits known as hedonic hotspots, where if you stimulate those neurons, uh, the rat will show more of the liking responses and less of the aversive responses to bitter things. Uh, and it works for opioids, it works for cannabinoids, basically the sort of brain's endogenous cannabis, um, and it works for, a uh, for another system that we don't know that much about in humans called the Rexin. Um, and so this research was pioneered by a researcher known as Ken Berridge, uh, and it's completely inspiring. It's been very, very influential also in the, in the sort of study of human um, hedonic feelings. So it's a little hard to imagine, though, from this drawing, what exactly these sort of liking reactions are in the rats. So I thought I'd show you, and then as we're talking about experiments on your own kids. These are my babies. This is last year. And uh, this is our taste reactivity study. Oh, it doesn't have sound. Oh, it does? So they are four months at this point, and they've never tasted anything except milk. And what you see right there, <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's the bitter, and this is the sweet, very stereotypical. Yeah. So I would just like to say that is the only experiment I've run on my children. <laughs> um, and they were clearly enjoying it a great deal. Uh, they found it very stimulating. Uh, now I'm going to show you um, the response, sort of a slow down response and how similar it actually is in a rat. This is from Ken Berridge's own um, website. So you see the kind of uh, slow licking it's not identical, but it's sort of parallel to the human response to sweet tastes. All right, so that is the basis for a lot of the rodent literature. Um, so in terms of these sources of inspiration, you know, these are really, you know, this is great research. Uh, but they do have some limitations. Most of the work that we do with neuroimaging in humans tells us that something happens um, you know, that two things happen at the same time, but they don't tell us that one thing is the cause of the other thing, um, uh, which is what we call correlational. And then with the um, um, animal research, they do amazing, you know, causal stuff. They can go in and like microstimulate just a single cell or like, you know, add a little drug to a tiny, tiny region of the rat's brain. So, so they can completely address causality. But even though I love this research, you have to admit that they are not measuring pleasure. They are measuring tongue movements. Um, and actually, when I have a really bad day at work, I like to think about the students in Ken Berridge's lab and how what they do is probably sit there and watch videos of rats that are like, and count how many times it licks forwards or gapes to the side or whatever. <laughs> Okay, to so kind of sum up uh, that bit, I mean, the really cool thing about the reward system and about pain and pleasure in the human brain, I'm trying to understand the relationship, is that pain and pleasure are basically sort of original motivators. They're basically, pleasure is a signal that tells us that this is probably a good, this is a good thing, this is good for survival. We should be doing more of this. And pain is a sign that tells us, oh, this could be dangerous, this could be harmful, we should probably do less of it. Um, accordingly, we can rely a lot on the rodent research. 
Uh, we can benefit from the fact that they can do all this crazy stuff with the rat's brains that we can't do um, in humans. However, just a kind of a small sort of additional cautionary note, this is a slice of a human brain in scale. This is a monkey brain, and here is the rat brain. So sort of a rule of thumb is that the rat brain is basically the size of the upper digit of your thumb. So even though the sort of the reward circuitry of the rat's brain is very large in proportion to its brain, it's actually tiny. And presumably, there is more going on in the human brain. Okay. So um, the next part of the talk is about pain. And specifically, it's about this question of why do we seek out painful activities? You know, why, why do we do this stuff? Why do we eat really spicy food? You know, why do people self-harm? Why are lots of people into, you know, s and m And why do we do endurance sports? I mean, this is just a random image that I Googled. You know, to me, this looks like this woman is in a lot of pain. You know, it's exactly the way I feel when I go running. Um, so, you know, what is it about it? It's really quite bizarre if you think about the function of pain. This is an illustration of why we feel pain, generally speaking. This is an individual um, from a village in the north of Sweden who has a congenital mutation that his family has, and he has it particularly strongly, which means that he doesn't feel pain in the joints. Uh, this is his knee, and this is an x-ray of his knee. This is why we feel pain. Pain is really useful. Pain tells us to stop doing stuff that could harm us, including, you know, don't walk on your leg if you broke it. Um, so in the light of this, why do we do stuff that causes us pain? So um, what I'm going to tell you about now is some um, work that I've done in uh, collaboration with, a, uh, with an Australian researcher known, um, called Brock Bastian, and most of this work is really his. Um, so we wrote some um, sort of reviews on potential benefits of the experience of pain, sort of trying to solve this paradox of why people keep doing stuff that causes us pain. So um, one of the statements that we make is that actually pain can increase pleasure, and I would just like to say uh, that we are not talking about chronic pain here. I am not suggesting that anybody who's had like a you know backache for three months is all of a sudden you know wildly enjoying life and you know <laughs> sunning themselves and going wow I've never experienced a spring like this. Um, <laughs> but acute pain, such as for instance the eating of a hot you know of a hot curry. Uh, can increase pleasure, and it can do so via at least um, three mechanisms. For one, you simply get a contrast effect. And we've all experienced this, right? Like, you know, you come in from the bitter cold, and you come into a warm room, and it feels steaming in there, right? So if you've just experienced something painful, whatever happens after, if it's pleasant, it might seem more pleasant. Um, then there is a really cool thing about pain um, that's very adaptive, that sort of evolution has basically um, taught us that when we feel pain, we should attend to the source of the pain. You know, essentially, somebody comes up and kicks you in the shin, you don't continue, you know, writing your text message. You actually attend to your shin and the person who's like, you know, harming you, and you're trying to figure out a way of getting out of that situation. Um, and so the benefit of that is when you're having your hot curry, you're basically the pain that, you know, all the activation of, of pain sensors in your mouth and on your lips and on your tongue are drawing your attention towards the body, kind of like mindfulness meditation. Actually, the, the effects of pain and mindfulness meditation are strikingly similar in this respect. Um, so you're attending to the meal and accordingly, you're enjoying it more because actually that curry is really tasty, you know, it has a lot of unique flavors. Um, so that's another possible benefit. I mean, I would just again like to say that, you know, in the long term, that's, it's a terrible thing. You know, if you, you've had, you know, backache for three months and it's constantly pulling your attention into your back and it's you know, stopping you from making, you know, good plans and attending to talks and whatever else you're doing. 
But in the short term, and in the case of, you know, hot curry, can be a good thing. And then uh, Brock did some really cool research uh, relating to pain and motivation. Essentially, I think everyone will recognize that sometimes when we've done something very unpleasant or painful, um, we treat ourselves, right? Like, oh man, you know, I really deserve another cocktail. You know, I had to sit through this super boring, co you know, lecture. And um, essentially, so Brock did a study of that. He got people to come into the lab. Half of them basically put their hand into um, ice cold water for a couple of minutes. It's really um, very aversive, quite painful. And then as a sort of a payment at the end of the experiment, they could choose between a pen and a chocolate bar. And then he simply counted the number of people who had pain, who had the chocolate bar, compared to the people who hadn't had the pain. And guess what? We like to treat ourselves. Accordingly, pain can lead to pleasure um, in a sort of a sub, you know, in a consequential kind of way. Another um, aspect that Brooks really looked into is the question of pain and morality. And here he did a really, um, again, a really fun study. Where, uh, which he called cleansing the soul by hurting the flesh, the guilt-reducing effect of pain. So what he did in this study is he got a group of students, got them to write for 10 minutes about something they had done that they felt bad about, like they felt guilty about, essentially. And then he compared them to a group of people who wrote about something else. Um, everyone then went and had, again, their hand into the ice bucket. But in this case, they could choose how long to ha keep their hand in the ice bucket. And guess what? The people who felt guilty kept their hand in the ice bucket for longer. They were essentially punishing themselves without necessarily being aware of it. Um, and the crucial part is they felt better about themselves afterwards. You know, they actually felt like they'd kind of, you know, they would paid the price, as it were, for, the, the, for their bad deeds. Okay, so final question that I wanted to talk about today um, stays in the pain domain, um, but it sort of harks us back into love because it says, does the pain of a broken heart mimic the pain of a broken arm? Um, this is a question that people are very enthusiastic about, and they are very enthusiastic in two ways. They will say, yes, it's the same. You know, neuroscience shows us that social pain or the pain of rejection really hurts in the manner of a physical pain. And then the people who disagree will say very vehemently uh, that that's complete, you know, an utter bollocks. And it's all about a metaphor and let's, you know, uh, let's leave it at that. So the whole debate started, a really sort of kicked off uh, with a study that came out in Science in 2003 um, with the title, Does Rejection Hurt? An FMRI Study of Social Exclusion. So what Naomi Eisenberg and her colleagues did in this study is they took a task that had just been developed uh, by Kip Williams, uh, known as a cyberball task. So in this task, um, as you can see, you have avatars. You have to remember this from 2003. That's why they look that way. Um, <laughs> and they are throwing the ball back and forth. So be a little, you have to imagine a little passport photograph here, one there, and then a photograph of yourself here. So that's your hand. So in the beginning of this game, the other players will be throwing the ball to you, as well as to each other, and then at some point they stop, and they just start throwing the ball back and forth between, between each other. So when I first heard about this game, I thought, as I'm sure most of you guys will think, what a stupid game. I mean, honestly, look at this. Like, how is this a way of addressing, you know, the pain of being rejected, the pain of being dumped, the pain of divorce, you know? Like, what kind of nonsense are these people doing? So it turns out, however, that I was completely wrong uh, because there are hundreds of studies using this task and thousands of participants, and even when the participants are saying, oh, I think the game was rigged, or I think something went wrong, I don't think they really meant to reject me, they still feel bad. I've run this study myself in 100 people, and even when you ask them bizarre social psychology questions like, do you find life meaningful? We see a decrease. 
after we put them through this game. I mean, you know, I, you have to give it to the social psychologists. They actually know what they're doing. Uh, this stuff really works. And I think the reason it works harks back to what I was saying about why social relationships are so important. Basically, you know, we are exquisitely sensitive to any cue that we are not part of a group because it's so central for our survival and sort of in the history of our species. And although we don't care that much about these avatars, it reminds us of situations where we've felt left out and everyone feels left out from time to time. Everyone feels inadequate. And we constantly strive you know, to belong and to, you know, to fit in with other people. Um, anyway, if we go back to the study, um, basically Naomi and um, her colleagues compared the activity elicited by in the brain by people being exposed to this re rejection task to real physical pain, and they saw some similarities. Saw some activity in a really sort of key part of the what was then known as the kind of the pain matrix, known as this anterior cingulate, and also in these sort of more prefrontal and insular regions. And the press went mad. You know, finally, we had proof. Does social rejection hurt? Science says it does. At the time, I was, I was working in a pain, pain sort of research lab, and I thought, but this is really weird, because actually, this isn't the pain matrix. It's just a tiny bit of the regions that we all always see when we put people in the scanner and hurt them. So this is the pain matrix. <laughs> um, this is a very typical illustration of the bits of the brain that tend to light up when we put people in the scanner and they experience pain. So it has you know, a lot of activity in a lot of different brain, brain regions. And at the time, Everyone called it the pain matrix. Now, that is completely forbidden. You know, you can't say that and keep your sort of um, credibility as a researcher anymore. And the reason is this paper right here um, by some former colleagues of mine, Andre Moro and Domenico Iannetti. And basically what they did is they compared painful stimuli to really intense stimuli that weren't painful. So these are basically stimuli that are tactile, it's a laser, but they're not painful. And what you see acti act, you know, activated is the pain matrix. Then they use really loud sounds, and guess what? They activate the pain matrix. And then they use really bright lights, and guess what? They activate the pain matrix. What this tells us isn't that you know, seeing bright lights, like I am right now, um, is painful. What it tells us is that most of what we see in the brain when we expose people to pain is processes related to them orienting their attention. Basically, when we get pain, as I was saying before, we need to attend to it. We need to find out what's causing the pain, and we need to find out what we're going to do about it. And that is also the case for a lot of other intense stimuli. So basically, what this tells us is that you can't look at a brain, even if it, you know, and assume that the person is feeling pain. Hence, Naomi Eisenberg's study probably didn't show us that social pain really hurts. Um, and in fact, as the sort of technological uh, processes have improved and we've gotten better at analyzing data from brain scanners, um, the sort of another set of findings emerged using um, machine learning techniques and basically trying to look at what happens within each of these regions. So looking at the patterns of activity within these regions. And so this paper came out in 2013. And basically what it did is it created a pattern that responded really well to physical pain. That seemed to be kind of selective for physical pain. And what you see here in the graph, actually a lot of you probably don't see it, is that it responded really well to physical pain not very much to physical warmth, not at all, to images of social rejection. In this case, they used a completely different model uh, of sort of social rejection. They actually took people who had been recently dumped by their boyfriend or girlfriend, put them in the scanner, showed them a photograph of the person who had rejected them, <laughs> and compared it to a photograph of, of a friend. So, 
So basically, I mean, neuroscience is a field that really follows the sort of um, the technological um, uh, improvements. So at this point, basically, we can see that although it's the same, some of the same brain regions, it's not the same pattern of activity within the same brain uh, regions. But overall, the, the sort of the take-home message that I'd really like you um, to remember after this is that as long as you guys can tell the difference between somebody kicking you in the shin and somebody breaking your heart, then there has to be a difference in the brain. Because the basis of all of your feelings and sensations is the brain. If you feel a difference, that difference comes from a difference in the brain processing. Um, so personally, I don't think this guy looks like he's been dumped. <laughs> I, think, I think somebody's kicking him very hard in the shin. Anyway, that was all from me. Thank you very much. <laughs>